Hello, it's good to be with you again. I'm Pastor Warren Hoyt. Today, we're going to talk about Chapter 8 in this book, Money, Greed, and God by Dr. J. Richards. And the chapter's title is, Are We Going to Use Up All the Resources? We've been looking at eight myths that Dr. Richards says so many people believe about capitalism. And I want to just go over them again briefly with you. First was the Nirvana myth. Comparing capitalism with some supposed ideal system out there that doesn't even really exist. Second was the piety myth, the idea that good intentions are all that really count rather than real results. Then there was the zero-sum game myth, the idea that if some win, others must lose. There's the materialist myth that wealth is static, it only can change hands, so if some people have it, well, it must be taken it from others. The greed myth is that the essence of capitalism is just greed. The usury myth is believing that working with money is inherently immoral, or that charging interest on money is exploitive. Then there's the artsy myth, the one we looked at last time, confusing aesthetic judgments with economic arguments. Today, as we look at Chapter 8, we're looking at what Dr. Richards calls the freeze frame myth, which is believing that things always stay the same. For example, uh, assuming the population trends will continue indefinitely or treating a current natural resource as if it will always be needed. Let me start off with a quote from Dr. Richards. He says, you've heard it a million times. The earth is overpopulated. We're breeding like rabbits and eating like locusts, and soon we'll run out of food, farmland, and fuel. We're members of the crew of Spaceship Earth. We have to preserve our dwindling supply of provisions, or our mission will soon be aborted. Our industrial technology is poisoning the water of the soil of the era. If we don't make radical changes now, it'll be too late. We'll destroy the earth. We'll all die. <laughs> this is found on page 183. And so Dr. Richards starts off talking about 19th century demographer Thomas Malthus. And that man predicted that the swelling human population would quickly overtake food production and lead to widespread famine. He was from the 19th century. He was wrong. Later he changed his views, but every generation, it seems, has a share of people to replace Thomas Malthus. <laughs> In 1968, biologist Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb, in which he said, quote, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, the world will undergo famines. Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death. He figured England had just a 50% chance of even making it to the end of the 20th century. And according to Greenpeace, the Club of Rome, the Sierra Club, the many people on both sides, liberals and conservatives, Christians and non-Christians, it's our capitalist system that's ruining everything and will soon bring it into the world. In fact, capitalism, according to these folks, is nothing but a huge Ponzi scheme where we actually are robbing future generations by using up all the resources that we have now. Our economic growth, we're told, is just unsustainable. We reap the benefits, but our grandchildren will reap the terrible costs. Jay says this, quote, The truth, despite untutored common sense, is just the opposite. As long as we can preserve our economic freedom and the spirit of enterprise, we will not use up all our resources, nor will we run out of food, water, or energy. The prophets of doom are demonstrably wrong. And it goes on to say that there is a grain of truth to all of this, of course, because the earth is uh, limited in surface area and so forth. There is a limited amount of the different uh, kinds of uh, resources that we use, and, and we're using many of them up. We're burning them up. The problem is we don't understand correctly, Dr. Richard says, the, the use of the word resource. What really is a resource? And also in this chapter, he talks about how we don't fully appreciate the wonder of human creativity. If we did, we'd get a different perspective. So it's a really interesting chapter. It's very important uh, because a lot of people think this way, that we're using everything up. And so Dr. Richards begins the chapter with five principles that he thinks basically most Christians will agree to. First, 
This is God's world, not ours. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and everything that it contains. Second, God created us as his image bearers, and as such, he, he gave us dominion over the earth. And some people have said that that's the reason we're, we're ruining the earth, because Christian teaching made us think we have, we're to dominate the earth. But Richards points out, domination is not the same as dominion. Dominion means we're not allowed to just destroy the earth to suit our whims. We're, we're called to be good stewards of the environment. We were given dominion. We're the stewards of the environment. We, we're not to dominate and just wreck the environment for our own uh, selfish ends. Third, uh, Jay Richard says, God intends for us to use and transform the natural world around us for good purposes. Fourth, he says the world is good, but it's fallen. And we have to realize that. So we, yet, we yeah, we can mess things up, and we have in the past many times. We can pollute. We can wreck the world. Number five, we can't build God's kingdom on our own, but our actions can make a difference for good. So again, Richard says almost all Christians agree on these principles. But he says, you know what, we don't really work them out very well in, in the practical sense. And as a result, we, what we actually do, though we may believe these five principles, what we actually do a lot of times is kind of buy in to the materialistic assumptions of our culture. So then he, he has a section, he talks about resources and price. And he says, we do use up resources, but as we do, the price form goes up. And this is so important because, you know, you just think, well, we're using them all up, we're going we're gonna to run out. But if you look at history, every time a resource begins to get scarce, that makes the price for it go up. And that in turn motivates various people or companies to, to search for more resources or to uh, uh, invent different ways to get out what there is out there or, or, or search for alternatives and so forth. And so the, this thing is fluid. And the price of something is kind of set by how difficult it is to get and how much need there is. If there's not a scarcity, then we say, well, we, this, we found all there is. But when there's scarcity, that raises the price, and it makes it worthwhile for companies to search for more. And so prices fluctuate, resources fluctuate. Remember, some of you that are older like me might remember back in the 70s, we had this huge oil crisis, and you had to wait in long lines at gas stations. Man, we were running out of fossil fuels. It was, it was doomsday, you know. Well, then what happened? The prices went up, so the oil companies learned new ways to find and extract fossil fuels, and guess what? It turns out the United States has more fossil fuel resources than any country in the world right here. We have tremendous resources. But, but they were telling us years ago that we had to depend on the Middle East and there just wasn't enough and so on. So Richards talks about how economist Julian Simon, in 1980, he made a bet with this guy I mentioned a minute ago, Paul Ehrlich, who said the millions are going to start in the 70s. Julian Simon made a bet with him that over the next decade, uh, in, the, in the 80s, that prices for various commodities, and they agreed on these five commodities. He said they're going to actually go down instead of up. Ehrlich said there's no way. We're, we're, we're using them all up. They're going to go up. The price is going to go up. The prices are going to skyrocket. But guess what? They made this public debate, and Ehrlich lost it. He, I mean, I'm sorry, public bet. And Ehrlich lost the bet. Why? <laughs> because of what Richard is talking about here in the book. <clears throat> the market caused companies to explore new ways of finding and developing resources, and as a result, the price for each of them went down. Here's a quote from J. Richard. Simon understood what Ehrlich did not, that the amount of stuff hiding in the ground somewhere is far less important than human beings devising new ways to access and exploit the stuff. He goes on to say, Simon also knew another indisputable fact. Over time, virtually any natural resource you can think of, oil, copper, mercury, coal, whatever, has gotten less scarce, more plentiful, and therefore less expensive. This is easily established by looking at the price trends of resources historically, adjusting for inflation, and over the long run, they always go down and not up. That's on page 188. So, 
things don't go the way we might sort of intuitively think they would. So Richard says, why is that? Well, the reason trends go against our expectations is because obviously something's wrong with our expectations. And, and what we're doing, he says, is that we're often still buying into some of the myths we've talked about earlier in the book, like the zero-sum game myth or the materialist myth. We're still thinking of material resources in that way. And we're, we're thinking of them just as a material commodity, like you know, gasoline in a tank or something. And we're forgetting that actually we create resources because it's human creativity and it's the way we use these things that is fluid and changing and developing. We find things, uses for things that originally we thought were, uh, uh, you know, just a problem. Remember that in the early days when petroleum would be found on somebody's property, they, they'd be bummed about it. They got this ugly, black, stinking stuff. It's very sticky. It was a negative. Then all of a sudden, mankind discovered uses for petroleum, and everything changed, and it became black gold, Texas tea, you know, like the Beverly Hillbillies. It, it, it changed. Now, if you found oil on your property, you'd be thrilled, man. You could move to Beverly Hills. And this kind of thing's repeated over and over. There was a scarcity of wood <coughs> in the 18th and 19th centuries. People used wood for everything, to heat their homes, to cook their food, you know, to do the industries that they did. And we're using it all up, so it's like, what are we going to do? We're running out of wood. Then people said, hey, there's this black stuff. It's coal. Let's try burning that. And, and sure enough, coal was better than wood. Pretty soon they were using coal, but then... They're using it up and using it up, and they're saying, man, we're extracting all the coal. There's not going to be any coal. What are they going to do? Well, the market caused people to search for new seams of coal and to develop new ways to extract what was there. And next thing you know, there was plenty of coal. And the truth is, energy costs have gone down over the centuries. So this is all wrong thinking that people engage in without realizing it. And it's what Richards calls in the eighth chapter of the book, the freeze frame myth. That's the idea that things will always stay the same. The population trends will continue. Natural resources will be always used in the same way they're used today and so forth. And it's just a myth. It's not the way things really work out in a practical sense and in a historical sense. All right. So first Richards makes that case. But then he says, yeah, but a lot of people said, well, that may be true. Okay. Maybe we're not running out of resources. Maybe we'll find more, develop different alternatives or whatever. Hey, but what about climate change? Look at we're using up all the resources and we're wrecking the planet doing it. I mean we're pumping out CO2, we're we're heating up the whole world and we're gonna we're gonna die. <laughs> it's the same kind of idea again. Now of course that would require a whole nother book. That's not what this book is about and that's not what I can talk about in this short little session. The whole idea of climate change. I mean it's really a uh, a uh, huge uh, issue today and something that is just, we're being told absolute lies. And the only way to refute this is to really take time and study. And of course, you can read books, you can <clears throat> watch things on YouTube, and you can hear the other side if you'll look for it. But to suffice, suffice it to say here, really the climate change movement has become practically a religion. And it's actually kind of a just a, a myth, and, and uh, Richard says, and I agree with him, that it's, it seems like it's a way for the left to try to stop capitalism and change our way of life. One report I watched on YouTube showed that, <clears throat> check this out, if the entire industrialized world were to shut down all of our industries that pump out CO2 and stuff, if we were to shut down all cars tomorrow, <clears throat> guess what? Nobody can prove for certain that we change the climate by even one degree centigrade worldwide. Not even one degree. Here's another quote. Regrettably, the environmental movement, which started with many noble goals, has now become the last line of defense in the left's attempt to stem the tide of global capitalism. Like communism, the environmental movement provides an all-encompassing vision of reality. Unlike communism, sorry, unlike communism, it has the benefit of a gratifying nature spirituality 
a nature spirituality. Al Gore, when accepting the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, said, the, here's a quote from him, our great, our great uh, maestro, our great sage, Al Gore. He said, quote, the climate crisis is not a political issue, it's a moral and spiritual challenge to all of humanity. It is also our greatest opportunity to lift global consciousness to a higher level. That's on page 196 of Richard's book. It's going to lift our global consciousness to a higher level? Really? It's a moral and spiritual challenge? Really? That sounds kind of like religious religion, doesn't it? Yeah, it's become a religion today. And I'll tell you what, what are the person who, who denies <laughs> this religion? Who denies what these people are teaching us? And who, or who questions it? Jan Richards has a quote from this one guy named Stephen Schneider who works for the National Center for Atmospheric Research. He's a climate researcher. And he said this in writing. We have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts we have. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest. So the man is saying that they're lying and they have to lie because their cause is so worthwhile. You know, they have to lie. It's for the good of mankind. Again, this is a big subject, but the truth is there's no real consensus that human activity is causing any of the warming trends. And it's almost certain that even the most radical changes in our ways of doing things w wouldn't help. You know, they would bankrupt us. They would set us back centuries. They would cause people to die. But they wouldn't change the climate in any significant way. And, and so that's just, that's just a fact. It's debatable, of course, but I'm telling you, it, it's a fact. And so Jerry Richards talks about at the end of the book there, with all these horror stories and all this fear-mongering, we, we often forget or miss the good news of all the progress that has been made in the area of the environment. There was a lot of pollution back in the 19th century, the 20th century. The Cuyahoga River in Ohio actually caught fire one time. There's so much oil on it. Chesapeake Bay was, was really dying. The Hudson River was all polluted and dying. But you know what? As we became aware, human beings basically don't want to live in a cesspool. We don't want to poison ourselves. We don't want to kill our kids. Whether we're Republicans or Democrats, we don't hate the environment. We want to have a, a safe environment, a clean environment. And as we, as we became aware of the damage that was being done, we did things legislatively and in other ways to reverse the trends. Today, these rivers and all are, have been cleaned up. Things are better. Life is getting better. Life spans are growing. We're more prosperous and more healthy than we've ever been. And even the United Nations admits this kind of stuff. And one of the main things that Richards brings out, we got to always remember, is that cleaning up the environment, stopping pollution and all, those are things that can be done by prosperous societies. They're not things that the poor countries can do because they're too busy trying to make a living and just survive in China and in India and in places like that. They don't care about pollution. They don't care about the environment. They throw their trash, pump out, you know, pollutants into rivers, fill the air with the air with smoke, and they don't have the money to trim back on that stuff to, to protect the environment. Poor countries can't afford to protect the environment. What's the point? The point is, look, the answer to the environmental issue is not to shut down our whole economy, ruin things by all the restrictions on all things like the Kyoto or the Paris Accords want us to institute in our government and in our countries. That's not the answer. The answer is to allow the economy to continue to prosper so that we can make changes and clean up things and be good stewards. We, sure, we need to take our responsibilities as stewards of the environment very seriously. We should all be for that. None of us are against that. We need to take care of this environment. We need to recognize when we're doing things wrong. We need to legislate and fight against anything that harms the environment. We can do things better. But capitalism isn't what's polluting. Capitalism isn't the problem. It's the solution. 
And that is the point kind of of the book. You know, some of the most extreme people in this environmentalist movement actually say we should eradicate the human race. We're the problem. We're ruining the planet. That is how wrong-headed some of them are. It's how crazy they are. The truth is, those of us who are Christians, we understand God created us in his image. He put us in charge of this beautiful planet. We're to be good stewards. We want to take that responsibility seriously. We want to not stifle, but unleash our creativity to make it possible that we can have a better environment, a better world. No, we're not running out of resources. Everything we need has been provided for us by our loving and our wise creator. What we need to do is stop listening to this environmentalist mania. Stop thinking that it's capitalism that's doing us this damage to our environment. And, and realize that capitalism is the solution, or part of it anyway. It's not the problem. Again, we've been talking about this book, Money, Greed, and God. This is the last of the uh, eight sessions I'm going to do on this book. Uh, I hope you'll get it and read it. It's a terrific book, and uh, the, right, the uh, way in which Dr. Richards writes, writes is very witty and very entertaining. Very useful and important contribution for our society today. Stay tuned, though, because I'm going to go into some other books and have some other studies for you in the near future. Until that time, I pray that the Lord will just richly bless you, and you'll go on in your walk with Christ and all that he has for you.